Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Champions Chess Tour finale. It is the final four, and it is the last day of the semifinals. After today, we will know who first and second are. Well, rather, we will know who's playing first for first and second, and we will know who is out in a tie for third and fourth place, winning $50,000. Going into today, Magnus Carlsen leads against Fabiano Caruana, so Fabiano has to win the second set to force a tiebreaker, and Nodirbek Abdusatorov leads against Wesley So. So Wesley needs to win the second set against Nodirbek to force a tiebreak, and then ultimately win that tiebreak. And that is all, and there is a massive amount of money up for grabs. Uh, today was a really long day for me. I'm actually uploading this almost at 10 o'clock at night, so Americans, you will maybe see this in the morning. Uh, folks living in other parts of the world will either wake up at 4 a.m. to see this or will see it just whenever they do. Uh, and uh, yeah, today was a really nice day. Today I woke up very early. I was actually on three pieces of media. I, I was on Canadian radio with Matt Turner. Uh, I was on uh, I was on two morning programs here in Canada, and then I did commentary. And I mean, it's it's just been a very very long day, and I'm I'm feeling very grateful. I also had a chance to sit down and interview Magnus, which. Uh, very much looking forward to publishing. That was a cool conversation. Some goofy questions in there, but actually it was a very nice interview and uh, definitely got over some of those uh, first time meeting Magnus Jitters. Fabiano Caruana, Magnus Carlsen, here we go. Fabiano needs to take down probably the greatest chess player of all time and he needs to do it in rapid, which is probably the worst format uh, for Fabiano to play against Magnus. I mean, he has his best chance in Classical. We know their World Chess Championship was extremely close. And in this game, Fabi provoked a, an aggressive uh, g5, but instead of getting g5, Magnus went back to the e7 square with his bishop and sort of played a KG uh, approach. Fabiano took some space on the queen side from Magnus. We traded bishops, and then we had castles, and Magnus played this move pawn to b5, just trying to seize some space and also trying to induce Fabiano into playing the move en passant. Now, Fabiano is a cultured man. He knows that en passant is, of course, forced, and now the uh, rooks have a staring contest on the a file because nobody wants to trade, because if you trade, then you are going to give away uh, some control uh, to your opponent. Now... Knight to d4 is played by Magnus. We have knight takes, pawn takes, and the knight going back to the e2 square, uh, targeting the pawn on d4. And now Magnus creates this impregnable pawn fortress with all of his pawns on dark squares. Literally, that is not an exaggeration. This bishop definitely feels like an imposter, but the position is actually completely fine. In traditional circumstances, you really don't want to play like this. It's actually really, really not advised. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's only if white is actually able to take advantage of the light squares. Like, for example, if white can go here, here, and teleport the knight to the d5 square, white will, of course, have a fantastic position. Uh, but do keep that in mind, because Magnus certainly has some light square weaknesses, and he's a very sound positional player, And but he, he definitely knows the dangers of what he's doing. Now, Fabiano immediately fights for those light squares. He puts his queen on a light square diagonal. Now he trades the rooks because the a file has lost a little bit of its allure. It doesn't matter that Magnus can control it. And now we have pawn to f4, and Fabiano, in the span of three moves, obtains not just a better position against Magnus, but a full-on, completely winning position. It is plus five and a half, and out of nowhere, Magnus is busted. And I think it all kind of started right around here. Notice Magnus's clock management. He thought for a while, he thought for nearly two and a half minutes, if not about that on this move. And suddenly came some problems as the entire impregnable pawn structure that he had created is quickly going to crumble. And this trade is bad. I literally just mentioned to you that the knight versus bishop dynamic will be really nice for white because white will be able to take advantage of the light squares if the knight landed there, but also there and there. And within the span of just a couple of moves, the game is virtually over. Now, I don't know why Fabiano did not play knight h5 right away. Uh, because knight h5 first would force the bishop back, but now he has yet another chance to play knight h5, and, and, and knight h5 is crushing because you threaten knight to f6, which would force the king back, but it's still not, you know, it's not completely trivial. For example, it looks like this is a good move, but suddenly rook c1, and white actually has to go here, because if king h2, there's bishop d6, which pins the queen to the king, and that would be a really big problem. So, instead of all of that, Fabi goes here, which apparently is a, uh, is a, is a mistake. Uh, because suddenly Magnus gets counterplayed. Magnus can completely abandon his bishop because now the knight cannot come to f6 with check, so the king doesn't have to go there. So if you play rook takes bishop, you actually get hit with queen f4 and some very violent counterplay because g3, queen f2 is actually mate, and knight g3, you lose your rook. So that is all to say that suddenly Fabiano Caruana 
is grinding down an endgame, and, uh, and, and he is no longer completely winning. Now, he is still being very clutch, and he does get two connected past pawns, as both guys with less than 10 seconds make some really catastrophic mistakes, and he is back to being completely winning as Fabi, because he has two past pawns. So, a lot of drama, a lot of chaos, but now Fabi gonna start the day really, really well, exactly like he did yesterday, winning a couple of very nice games against Magnus, before throwing it all away with one night check. That's what happens when you get 10 seconds on the clock. In this position, apparently white needed to play rook c7 and then d7. That is, or, 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 or king e4 followed by trying to play e6. So, for example, king e4, uh, and there, let's say, you know, king h7, and uh, now white can maybe walk the king in or something like this. I mean, uh, yeah, so supposedly there was a better way to do it. This is not the way. This is not the way because all of a sudden the move g5 becomes viable. You can actually not take the, 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 the piece here because this is hanging. And suddenly Magnus gets the pawn. You cannot take the pawn because rook takes knight. And this game ends in a crazy turn of events as Fabiano... Uh, is threatening to win by blocking the rook. Magnus has to sack his rook for defensive measures. Oh my goodness, absolutely chaotic game that ultimately ends in Kings. And, uh, and this is just the story of the match. I mean, Fabiano has played exceptionally well against Magnus. He just cannot put him away. He just cannot put him away. I mean, he's just at all. Like, I, I, at all is a bit of an exaggeration, but yesterday he was up a queen, you know? Yesterday he was up a queen in that game in the first game of the match, and he ended up losing, so this one hurts. Um, and and, and uh, Magnus is about to really make sure it hurts, because we go for a queen's pawn opening, Magnus deviating from e4, not getting anything with the white pieces there, and this time Fabi plays cdcd. Now, cdcd is a line that became popular about three years ago, not that you have to know this, but you can use it to win your local trivia night. Uh, this line is a very forcing line in the semi tarash that is basically killing the game for black, meaning black is no longer... Uh, worse, uh, and, and, and basically can try to equalize by trading many pieces. Magnus plays the most forcing way, you trade the queens. Uh, but then, instead of knight g5, you actually play knight e5. Knight g5 would attack two pawns, knight e5 just attacks one, so it actually looks pretty stupid. It looks like, why would you put your knight here? Well, apparently the idea is very quick development, and I mean, Magnus does play these lines, I think, a bit more than Fabiano. Actually, if you check the database, I might be wrong, but I don't know if Fabi has ever played CDCD. I mean, I really don't remember. I could be totally mistaken, but I, Fabiano does not strike me as a CDCD kind of guy. Uh, just, a, you know, just a cassette tape kind of guy. So Magnus is probably digging into his, uh, you know, tank of, of memory, and he is trying to find some lines, and he plays knight d5 check, and, and he gets the bishop, which is very important because white's position is so strong that despite being a pawn down, black's king is in the center, white will probably win this pawn back, and it's just really a matter of time. Bishop 2e1 is a ridiculous necessity, otherwise the bishop is trapped, and then you play rook e5, and then you're going to win a pawn back. One pawn has been won back, now white probably, there we go. And this is what Magnus has to work with, which is essentially the absolute worst thing you can give Magnus. The position is very slightly imbalanced. He has a potential to play essentially forever with his two connected pawns against the two separate black pawns. Could Stockfish draw this game with black? Yes, likely, but white can play forever. Magnus gets the king away, rook c5, and he also has more than double Fabiano's time. Rook f1 forces the king back, and now Fabi trades, and we have this endgame. Again, probably holdable. But it's Magnus, and it's really not a situation you find very pleasant. Fabiano creates this structure of pawns. Again, Magnus wants to avoid quickly trading too many pawns. Uh, he wants to hunt these pawns as much as possible. He also might want to avoid trading both rooks. A bishop versus knight endgame, he has to guarantee he's winning at least one of the pawns. G3. Rook e4. Bishop c4, putting pressure. Okay. Solid. Right, rook h4. All right, we're looking. Maybe we're going there. Maybe we're going here. What are we going to accomplish? b5. Yeah, Fabi's doing a really nice job. This is excellent defense from Fabi. He is completely pushing Magnus backwards. Yeah, Magnus. I mean, you got to give credit where it's due. Just an exceptional job here by Fabiano. Rook f2. Okay, he goes for a rook trade. Fabi trades, but, you know, that pawn on h5 is a little bit weak, but you can just play knight d4. Okay, the idea is, of course, rook h5, knight g7, so that pawn is still protected. Rook c5. Bishop F. Oh, this is getting a little bit dicey now. He's poking and he's prodding and he's rookie five, but he still can't win anything somehow. He does grab a pawn. Now knight c4. Apparently the evaluation is still equal, but rookie three is a little bit of a misstep. Um, I think the computer here uh, preferred something like just keeping the rook on c5, but the second time Fabi played rook back to e3 was a huge mistake. 
Um, in this position, after rook e1, bishop f3, something like rook f1 or f5 preventing this would have kept the game going. This unfortunately allows a rook trade. Or fortunately, depending on if you're a fan of Magnus, and uh, the pressure pays off. We go to this, and I told you bishop for knight only works if these pawns are going to go, but it's worse than that because actually these pawns are now on light squares, which was nice in a rook end game when the pawns protected the white, uh, restricted rather the white position. But this game is a vintage Magnus endgame grind where the opponent sla sa sadly makes a slight inaccuracy and um, Magnus wins. And uh, the match is all but over. It is all but over uh, because Fabiano is down 2-1. to one. He's down 2-1 to one and he lost the set yesterday. So all Magnus needs is a draw and he is going to put Fabiano away. E4 from Fabi. All right. E5 from Magnus. You play not to lose, this is what you play. We have an Italian, we have d3, bishop c5, and Fabi again playing this provocative line. Magnus going back to something that worked well in the last game. Actually, we have essentially the exact same position. And b5, the same exact approach from Magnus. Uh, en passant, possible, but this time we have queen b3. That move uh, is actually a fork, but uh, you are not in any way, shape, or form intending to take this pawn because all of a sudden you are going to create crazy stuff over here for your opponent. But now Magnus defends his pawn and attacks. These are perhaps the two most surprising moves in the entire game for me. I mean, I'm not sure there's much else you can do. When you play fe6, you probably make a declaration that you want to create an attack. But knight h5, g5, keep in mind, this is not a must-win game. Magnus Carlsen is not the one that is playing this for a win. He doesn't have to win the game. He just has to not lose. And I, I was brought in the broadcast uh, right around here uh, to get my thoughts on the game, and I thought, well, this is really interesting that he's playing like this. And apparently he should have been patient. Apparently he could have played here, and he could have went here, and then, you know, prepared a little bit. But instead of that, he went straight to f4. Now bishop takes. And this looks really good for white. Uh, for black, right? I mean, just as a human being, I'm looking at this, 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 and I'm thinking, oh my god, white is going to get checkmated. I think most of us actually here would prefer to play the black position. But as it so happens, the best way to meet a strike on the flank is to strike back in the middle. You see, an attacking side really likes a closed center that is very difficult to bust open with pawn or peace trades because if you open up the center of the board when you're getting attacked, your opponent now has something to deal with. And in this case, uh, yeah, that is very much what is happening. All of a sudden, Magnus is like, how am I actually going to attack Fabiano? But Magnus is extremely confident. He just won that, that other game. And, you know, Fabi, and, and, and look at this, just h5. And Fabi has misstepped. He is now definitely not any better. Magnus has completely arrived on the king's side. And he's getting pushed back. And Magnus goes grabbing a pawn, which apparently is not a good decision. Apparently, it was better for Black to go here lose the pawn on g4, and then just take this one and just apply pressure, which looks loose. I mean, that rook looks real loose. But, but he took this pawn, and then he went back. And he thought, well, it's just a matter of time. I'm going to take, I'm going to hide my king, I'm going to get my pieces in the game, and Fabi's cooked. Fabi is completely cooked. And then here, Fabiano Caruana said, I am the freaking man, and if you think I am cooked, boy, do I have news for you, Mr. Magnus Carlsen. That sounds like a guy standing up to his bully. That's not really what Fabiano sounds like or says during games. Pawn to c4. If you are being attacked on a side of the board, you start striking back in the center, and suddenly it becomes very clear that black is ill-equipped to stop the transformation of the queenside pawns, and white is going to push the A pawn all the way, which means Magnus has to go here. But as it turns out, Magnus didn't have to go there. He could have kept attacking. The other hidden idea of pawn to c4 was not pawn takes c4, queen takes c4, which is kind of nice. Pawn to c4 opened the door for white's queen to go that way. And as it turns out, who is attacking who? This entire game, Magnus marched down Fabiano like a mafioso whose rent money was three months late. And as it just so happens, there was a trap door in the store. And uh, we're in big trouble now if you are Magnus Carlsen. Queen H3 check and Magnus is tanking. 42 seconds on the clock. Oh my goodness. Rook to G3. Knight back to f3. Suddenly those those little knights that were pushed into the corner as white's king side was getting ravaged are opening up. Magnus has to sacrifice his rook and start running his king. But it's too desperate. 
Rook c1 played by Fabi, by the way. That is not a blunder of a rook because the bishop is pinned to the queen. But there is rook takes f3 in this position, which is a pretty cool tactic. Rook f3, there is bishop c1. Both guys got too low time. Fabiano completely chops down Magnus Carlsen's position and against all odds defeats Magnus to force an Armageddon. Oh my god. Oh my goodness. You can't ask for more in this match. Fabiano has beaten Magnus as many times in rapid chess as Magnus has beaten him. You cannot ask for a better performance. Now, the Armageddon bids to play with the black pieces were 10 minutes and 0 seconds for Magnus and 9 minutes and 58 seconds for Fabiano Caruana. Two seconds of difference. And I, you know, I, I thought, well, Magnus bid 10, and he had a feeling that Fabiano would bid a little bit under him, so he's fine playing with white, but having a 5 minute and 2 second time advantage. As it turns out, uh, Magnus said in the post-game interview, the post-match interview, that, um, or actually, he said it not, in the, he said it in the Armageddon interview, which they do, you know, before the players reveal. Uh, Magnus said he was just kind of like tired; he had no idea what to bid, so he just bid something. Which I just, I just find that very funny. <laughs> like, all, as commentators, it's, oh, we have to sit there going, oh my god, this is like, and like these guys are just like exhausted and just, you know submitting bids so fabiano has the black pieces fabiano has nine minutes and 58 seconds and uh, fabiano has draw odds so fabiano wins this game or rather doesn't lose this game uh we go to a tie break match between magnus and fabi which is which is just absolutely sensational and what everybody wants a spanish a mainline spanish and now fabiano surprises magnus he does not play b5 and bishop c5 which is what he has been playing recently that is the Archangelsk variation. He doesn't play the classical line with bishop e7, d6, and b5, etc. He plays knight takes pawn. And you might be wondering, how does black not do that more often? Isn't that just a free pawn? This is just called the open Spanish. It's called the open Spanish because it's a real thing that has been played many, many times. And with good play, white will win that pawn back, but white is not going to, you know, be down a pawn. d4. Rookie 1, b5, d5. Now... Yeah, d4 is the uh, is the main line. Bishop e7 uh, is a move, for sure. I think actually b5 and, and d5 uh, first might be, but it doesn't really matter because b5 and d5 is played. And we have a, a main line position, and now we have h3. And h3 is apparently a sideline. I think it is more common for white to play bishop e3, knight bd2, go after this knight and play something like bishop to c2. But Magnus plays this and then this. And from the opening, uh, Fabiano is completely fine. Like, Fabiano has a completely fine position. In fact, if Fabiano had played f5 here, he might have just straight up been better with black. Uh, that knight is extremely strong. And actually, after ef6, rook f6, white has very, very, very... Uh, black, excuse me, uh, has very real attacking possibilities. And white, which is what I said first, has re very real problems. But instead of moving his f-pawn, I think Fabiano played a little bit tense, and Magnus did mention he felt Fabiano was definitely tense in the Armageddon and, and, and trying to trade a lot of pieces, as you can see here. You're trying to just get a little bit of stability in the position. But Magnus, very, very clever idea, trading the queens. Not a move that a lot of us would consider or play, but it is what he does because he just needs the tiniest of microscopic advantages. Uh, he has achieved that in this position, and now he can essentially play the position until uh, you lose your mind. Uh, ideas like e6 exist, right? Bishop c7, I mean, maybe a4 to poke at the queen side, b4 to fix the pawns and control that square. Fabiano tries to solve everything forcefully with the move pawn to d4. Rook c1 anticipating the opening of the position. d c3, rook c3. If the pawn marches into d3, it will be promptly apprehended by both rooks and the knight, so you can't do that. d c, rook c3, knight b4, and rook c7. And in the skirmish, Fabiano has lost the pawn, but he has still eyes on this pawn. He has eyes over here. This is a potential fork that wins material. Magnus bulldozing his way through, targeting the bishop on e7. Bishop g5, knight g5. And in this position, in this position, knight d3 is the move. And after knight d3, which is a triple fork, white has to play e6, which is a very interesting idea. The idea being that if knight takes, you take, and then you can actually promote, and that's a major problem. But after knight d3, e6, uh, the best move is f6. And then, and then the play goes on. And the game is equal, but that is Fabiano's chance. He needs to start with knight d3. Instead of that, Fabiano starts with f6. 
That is a problem. He needed to play knight d3 first, because then he would have had eyes on multiple targets. Clearly he didn't like something, otherwise he would have played it. But he plays f6, and suddenly he is in bad shape, because now Magnus gets in. Magnus's pawn is now two squares away from queening. The rook controls the entire seventh rank. Magnus can actually lose both of these pawns because he can invest fully in the rook, uh, the, 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 the pawn that is currently being blocked by the rook. Fabiano creates a little bit of breathing room for his king, but Magnus is just ready to sacrifice those pawns. Another very important detail you might be overlooking is Magnus's king is completely safe. Otherwise, the back rank could not have been cleared. And actually, Magnus... Uh, allows a little bit of counterplay here, which does look a little bit dicey, this hanging, not, this hanging rook and this hanging rook, but the bigger idea is actually to trap the king in a cage. So if you play this, I'm not going to take your rook. I'm going to force a draw. I'm going to keep your king in a box, which is, which is real nice, but key detail. And you now are no longer in a box, but more importantly, you are just headed for a winning knight in rook endgame, and this one ends with a brilliant move. Knight takes g7. Pawn is queening, defended by the knight, but if you take the knight, it's a discovered attack. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of Fabiano Caruana's journey here in the Champions Chess Tour finale. Two Armageddons lost to Magnus Carlsen, one with white, one with black. Absolutely brutal. He wins $50,000, but he surely would have wanted more. This is the number one and number two ranked chess players in the world. This is a rivalry that has been at the top of chess for over five years at this point. And... Um, Magnus Carlsen himself thinks that the second best chess player on the planet is Fabiano Caruana. Out of his own mouth. So, that's special. That's pretty cool. But it's not cool for Fabiano. Magnus Carlsen is the first finalist, and he awaits the winner of the match between Wesley So and Nodir Bekab Dusatorov. Don't go anywhere. I'll make this quick. Wesley So lost yesterday to Nodir Bek, and he trails one to nothing in the sets. And um, this match was absolutely nuts. All right? Wesley So showed up today and played B3. He threw all conventional openings and wisdom out the window. Nodjerbek was taken aback. He was taken a little bit aback. He plays E5. He's, he gives uh, Wesley the developmental target, and Wesley plays a very obscure line. This is, if you've never seen this before, it might make you very, very confused why top chess players are putting their pieces out on the edge of the board like this but you are trying to apply pressure to the black position with knight, bishop, and bishop in the corner. I promise all of this has been played before. Knight to a3, knight to c4, both fighting for that square. Uh, then the bishop retreats voluntarily. Black plays a6 to prevent the knight from replacing the bishop. c4. Now, I have actually had this position myself many, many times. Uh, I, I think one of the best moves after c4 is to play, like, c5, maybe castles. And then in this position... Um, yeah, c5 to stop white from playing d4, or if white plays d4, then you need to play rook e8 and keep the tension. And rook e8, at least if the move c5 happens, you can go out of the way. This looks really nice for white, but it's actually horrible. It's completely horrible. You put the knight on f5 or g6 and, you know. So, e takes d4, e takes d4 is a major mistake. You'll notice Nodjebrek is down 1043. What ha What happened? Well, he's thinking a lot. I think this opening completely caught him off guard. Wesley came, started doing unconventional stuff, started going blah, 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 at the chessboard, started blowing raspberry. Blah, 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 blah. And Nodjebek was like, what the hell is this guy doing? That's not actually what happened. But the equivalent of that, but playing certain chess openings, and it caused him to make a couple of dicey decisions, like leaving his pieces in front of his pawns. We learn as beginners we don't want to do that because we block the other pieces from getting out. And I'm not calling Nodjebek a beginner. But I am saying that moving multiple pieces in the opening multiple times without using your center pawn, sometimes it really is just a matter of back to basics. And look at Wesley just sh just shutting off the lights of the black position. The black position is not able to move forward. Look at this, forcing the bishop to take. And when the dust settled from the opening, Wesley had a very pleasant position. Now, he could play knight f3 and just castle short and slide the queen out of the way. But no, 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 no. Wesley lost yesterday. Wesley wants to make a statement. And he goes H4. Wesley so wants to bury the 19-year-old who won the World Rapid Championship in 2021. Did you know that Nodirbek Abdusatorov is the second youngest chess player in history to win a World Championship title at the, year of, at the 17 years of age? World Rapid Champion? The only person that has won a World Championship at a younger age is the Chinese woman... 
Oi Fun. She won the World Women's Championship at the age of 16. Teenagers watching this. That's pretty big shoes to fill. You don't got to be a world champion, but definitely stop spending so much time on your phones, get more sleep, and do well in school. Age five. I feel like all teenagers just do drop shipping now. Like, they get all those Instagram reels that are like, here's how I drop ship stuff. So, gee, maybe it works. Huh? Maybe I'm just a hater. Queen d4, rookie eight, and... Uh, and in case it's not clear, uh, this first game was an absolutely rejuvenated Wesley. So knight c5, tricky idea to fork there. And if you go here, there's knight to e4. But uh, this doesn't work. It took Wesley about 15 moves of game number one on day number two. He's going to win a piece. He does. Checkmate is still borderline unavoidable. This game becomes a little bit weird. Like, it looks like White's King is under attack. It's not. He's just up a piece. Nodjabrek sacrifices a little bit of material and gives a check that, like, looks like it's going to be made. It's going to be made if you don't know anything about chess, but if you know a little bit, Queen to d4, and Wesley is just... W w that's it. I mean, Wesley is just unstoppable. But if you thought that was going to be the whole story... You don't know anything about the top players in the world. Wesley So is looking to put the match away. He won both games. He won that game, and then he won the next game, and then he tried to put Nodjerbek away, and Nodjerbek sacrificed a pawn with check in the opening, lost his right to castle, and then Nodjerbek brought out his queen and his knight, and this man is about to rain absolute hell on the white position. This is crazy. Crazy line by Wesley to play knight f5. Wow. Now watch what Wesley has to do in this position. Wesley is completely lost. Unless he finds one move. That one move, I am not joking, is to pick up your bozo of a king and go king to d2. That is the only way that you don't lose. Wesley goes running. King to d2. King to c2. And then, Wesley, in this position, after building that beautiful shelter, rather than playing knight d2 and waiting for Nodjerbek and trying to defend himself, Wesley starts fighting back. Which sometimes is recommended, but not in this particular case. And now, here comes Nodjerbek. And it is bad. Here comes Nodjerbek. But I got news for you. This is anything but the end of the game. Because after BC5, DE4, Nodjerbek blunders. A tactical skirmish. Takes, takes, takes. Sacrificing the queen. A big mistake. Rook D4. And all of a sudden, Wesley's pawn is queening. Nodjerbek takes the bishop. Wesley queens with... What? What's your... What just happened? Wesley brought a queen back from the dead. Wesley just... Hold up, can we get an instant replay of that? Wesley lost his queen, and that might be one of the fastest turnarounds I have ever seen. Five moves later, he monster reborns it, and it's just back. And then he runs his king off to the corner there. He's going to run his king to b1, and I told y'all, this game was completely insane. Both guys go under a minute. Wesley hides his king on the edge of the board. Nodjerbek is up a pawn in an opposite colored bishop endgame with some rooks and knights. And what ends up happening is Wesley tries to attack Nodjerbek so bad and then tricks him on the first rank with the move rook to g2. If you take, it's a fork. But if you go anywhere, I take the rook. So Nodjerbek has to repeat moves, but that would lose him the match. So instead of that, he sacrifices the rook completely. And he sacrifices the rook because now he has two pass pawns. While Wesley now begins walking his king up the whole board to win the B pawn. This is completely insane. Guys have less than 10 seconds on the clock. We get a queen trade, but Nodjerbek's pawns are too strong. They're too strong, but they're a little bit too far apart. Wesley indecisive. Instead of going for the B7 pawn, starts bringing his king back. And it's simply too slow. But wait a minute, White's rook controls the entire first rank how are you going to queen two pawns on a first rank if the rook is going to eat them well you're going to shuffle you're going to get a little bit nervous if you're not your back and then you're going to realize oh the knight should not play defense the knight should play offense e1 queen 
Knight, Shield, and Nodjebrek won. But it was Wesley. It was Wesley who won the second set. And it was Nodjebrek versus Wesley So in an Armageddon tie-break playoff. They went to the third and final set. They made two draws, and they bid, Wesley So bid, nine minutes and 27 seconds, and Nodjebrek bid 919. Here we go. This is a $50,000 game of chess. If Wesley wins, he joins Magnus in the finals, guarantees $100,000. Wesley loses or does not win, he gets third and fourth with Fabi, and Nodjebek goes to the finals. We have a in English, all right, we have a, a reverse Grunfeld kind of type of structure, maybe a reverse Karl Kahn type of structure. We have DC going for an isolated pawn. Nodjebek, 9 minutes and 19 seconds, which is what he bid. And now Wesley just expanding and playing solidly against an isolated pawn. Nodjebek creating a weakness on the C5 square, which he's, he's immediately going for. And then he gallops into Wesley's position, puts his knight on C4. Now, Wesley is only up 3 minutes. Remember, he started the game up 5 minutes and something like 30 seconds. So, so far, this is not a good turn of events. But you'll notice Nodjebek spent a lot of time putting his bishop on d7. That was the first sign of hesitancy. He might have just played bishop f5 or bishop here and been completely fine. But he goes here and then he puts his other knight here. All right? Rook d1. The play of the man who's playing against the isolated pawn is a little bit easier. Now Wesley plays knight b2. He's looking to trade, but he's keeping that four-minute time advantage on the clock. And he's creating a nice shelter for his pieces. Knight on d3. A lot of pieces on the board. Very intertangled. Very messy position. Rook going to c8. The four-minute time advantage is still there. Bishop e5. The queen goes to b6. Queen b2. We're getting a bishop trade, which is apparently a mistake. But then here Wesley goes here. He loses a lot of his advantage, but he's still up three minutes on the clock, and the players only get a bonus time on move 60, and we've only played 24 moves. Nodjebek has three minutes and 20 seconds to play 36 moves. That's 200 seconds to play 36 moves. That is basically, I don't know, six seconds per move for 36 moves. Is the accuracy going to sustain? Nodjebek starts thinking he is now below three minutes. Knight f1. A rook trade is on the board. And in this position... Nodjebek spent 1 minute and 12 seconds. That is nearly 50% of his time. He froze. And he could have gone for rook here. The best line after rook e8 is e3, knight f3, king here, and then knight to e4, which just creates, I believe, it, no, no, knight e4 blunders, knight d5. Maybe you play g5 and, and you go, like, aggressive. But Nodjebek could not come up with a decision. And instead of that, he went into the tank, played rook d8. And now he has a minute and 24 seconds to play 32 moves. And my friends, you can be one of the best players in the world, but that's not enough time. After all of that, he loses his pawn on d5. He tries defending himself. He puts a lot of pieces on dark squares. We could be in for a very long endgame. Wesley poking at him. Queen e4. But... In this position, the best way for black to play would have been g4 and try to restrict the position. But Nodjebek blunders his pawn, thinking he has counterplay. He does not. And a few moves later, Nodjebek Abdusatorov resigned. Queen takes c6. If you take, I make a queen. Wesley So joins Magnus Carlsen and is another finalist in the Champions Chess Tour finale. They will begin tomorrow. $100,000 is second place. $200,000 for first place. I can't wait. Commiserations to Nodjebek Abdusatorov and Fabiano Caruana on exceptional tournaments. There is no bronze medal match. See you all tomorrow. Get out of here.